Welcome to Transformation with Martinet. Conquer everything and compromise nothing. This show brings you real, raw, and vulnerable conversations. If you have never liked small talk and have been on a personal growth journey for a long time, stay tuned as Martinet and her guests share empowering stories. Now is the time to own your past and look toward your future with hope. Believe in your dreams and all that you want to achieve is possible. Transformation coach Martinet helps you accept and love you for you. It's time to listen to your heart and tap into your unlimited potential. You have the answers you need inside. Sometimes you just need the right guide to help allow transformation to happen. Transformation with Martinet starts now. Welcome, welcome everyone to Transformation with Martinet, where you conquer everything and compromise nothing. I am kind of, you could say, on location today. Um, my husband is in Missouri, so I decided to visit him. It's been over a month that we saw each other. So it's nice to um, it's nice to be here. And it and it's also like, as you know, I, when I introduce my guest, I know she's gonna know exactly what I'm talking about because in personal development, you know, we gotta put ourselves in these really uncomfortable places. And right now I'm uncomfortable. I don't have my my lighthouse backdrop. I don't have everything set up. I don't have my microphone. I don't have things that I'm used to for this. So I'm a little nervous that we might just blip out or something's going to happen. But the universe has us. God has us. We are good. And um, I know that today with my guest, we're going to bring you an awesome show. And without further ado, I want to welcome my friend who's somebody I've been, you know, and a lot of my guests have I, I've, I've known for a while, which is so amazing. And um, She's just a, an amazing guru and is trained under the best. And without further ado, welcome, welcome, Karen Kenny. Hey, thank you so much. The first thing I have to say is I, I never use that word guru. I always say mm -hmm. I'm nobody's guru. Your own guru exists within you. And that word guru um, has different connotations and meaning depending on who's translated it. And mm -hmm. sometimes it is it means, you know, uh, someone who brings... Uh, light to the dark or somebody who brings truth to ignorance or something that is so dense and heavy, right. it's kind of unmovable, but it's an important yeah. distinction. You didn't do anything wrong. It's an important distinction for me when I get called that or whatever. And I always say the only guru I am is of myself. And mm -hmm. hopefully I can be helpful to other people so that they find their own inner guru. So yeah, I love so, that. So I love that. <laughs> thank you. for Cause I think, you know, a lot of times in the way, you know, certain organized religions or spiritual structures or whatever get set up is that in a lot of ways, it creates unhealthy codependent relationships and it disempowers the people who are actually like looking for support or guidance or help. And I always say, um, you know, when you hire a coach or a mentor or anybody who's helping you with transformation, like, you know, we're pointing to particular things. And what we're usually pointing to is back to your own inner teacher. And I always say, don't fall in love with the pointer. Amen. Fall in love with what we're pointing to. You know what I mean? Yes. And I love that. And I'm glad that you made that distinction because, you know, it, it's like some some people like you and things that I've heard from you and knowing what you've been through is just like, whoo, you know, just really cool. So it just makes me think of, you know, the term guru and, you know, some of the things you even read by Rumi or um, uh, Eckhart Tolle, you know, just these kind of people, it's just like, wow, just like, just a little bit of their information is like, just gets you in this whole path, like just thought process and like, oh, okay, how can I hone in on this? And how can I, how can I just live my best life? Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, so just thank you so much for having me on your show. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be here. And I can't wait to have this conversation. And listeners, if you can hear the sound of my voice, thank you for tuning in. Yes, absolutely. And doesn't she have like a wonderful accent? It's just, oh. you know, it's just, I, I, I am, a, um, as, as Jacob knows, and you know, a lot of um, my producer here, and a lot of people know, I, I love accents. It doesn't matter how they are, what, where they come from, male, female, it doesn't matter. I just love it. You know? Yeah, I have a boss. So it's a Boston accent and I love accents as well. So yes. in fact, we're, my sweetie and I were just laughing because I was Siri, you know, on your iPhone, like yes. Siri does never, ever, ever, ever understands what the 
I'm saying like Eva. And so yeah. I was, he, I, he went out for a run and I was, I said to him, I'm laying on the floor at the gym doing lying leg raises, right? Abdominal lying leg raises. So I yeah. say to him, how was your run? I'm just finishing up my lying leg raises. And all of a sudden Siri sends to him, lying like raisins. I was like, what? I'm not lying like raisins, Siri, because she can never understand my accent. It's yeah. just funny that you say that. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I really think that you should change Siri to what I have. I call him Nigel. He's my oh. <laughs> sexy British. <laughs> Even better. He, yeah, he talks to me instead. I, I prefer that. Even better. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, why don't we talk about like, at least uh, like the, well, your journey, maybe in the beginning, how did you get started? Like on a path of, of development, which I know is many years ago and you've worked with some pretty cool people. So like, how did this start for, and what, what made you go on this path? Like, yeah. So, um, assuming, I don't know if, you know, people know the, the so to sum it up very quickly, I'm a spiritual mentor. I'm a life coach. I'm a uh, certified integrative hypnotist. I am, um, I've been a yoga teacher for over 25 years. I'm a writer, speaker, podcast host. I do a lot of things, right? Gateless writing instructor, whatever. So, and the reason why I'm bringing all that up is not to just be like, oh, aren't I fancy, but to just give an idea of like, I've always been a really curious kid because that's an important part of my journey. Yeah. So I follow my curiosity and I follow the call of my hat. So that's an important preemptive thing to this. So, you know, like a lot of people, I had a very challenging and difficult childhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the highlight story of that, um, there's a lot of shit that went down, but like the highlight story is that my mother was murdered when I was 12 years old, very violently, brutally, she was beaten to death. And um, that, that the events kind of leading up to that. And then what happened after that, my life was just never the same again. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just like, oh, my mother was missing. It was like, now we have nowhere to live. My mother and my stepfather were separated at the time. He didn't want us. And so I ended up going to live with my sister with strangers, people I didn't know, and aunt and uncle who I didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. So I was really kind of emotionally on my own from like 12 on, but then definitely physically on my own from 17 on when I moved out of their house. So I lived with them for about four and a half years, maybe five years from 12 to 17. And then at 17, mm -hmm. um, I went to Boston University. I went to, I went to college. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of confusion, a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, a lot of disillusionment, a lot of fear, like so much fear in my childhood. I grew up in Lawrence, Mass., which is a little immigrant city, about 30 miles, tough little city, about 30 miles north of Boston. And I used to say how even the language of my childhood was violent, just the way that we talked to each other, you know, it wasn't uncommon for people to just, just things that uh, like you go to the West coast sometimes when I went to live in LA. And, you know, East Coast people, we just kind of talk to each other a little differently sometimes. So, so it was just a, yeah, it was a very, um, a childhood filled with a lot of trauma. And mm -hmm. so because back then, so I'm 54, right? So back then there weren't really like life coaches and stuff like that, but what there were, were books. And this is what I always say. So books were my first teachers and mentors and spiritual, you know, guides and things like that. Books saved my life. I've always been a lover of words and reading. And there's one of the gifts my mother gave me is a love of reading and books and words. I always say we didn't always have food in the house, but we always had books. And I had a library card and library cards, uh, uh, they, they, they basically even the playing field for poor kids. You know what I mean? And so it was a huge gift for me. And so as I was trying to, I always say I was my first client. I went first and I was trying to figure out like, how do I stop feeling so awful? Like I was terrified all the time. I had so much fear. I was so sad. And I felt like I was on a certain level tasked with trying to figure out how to move past this thing that had happened or move through or understand this awful thing that had happened to my mother. And so I, I went basically on a quest. I went on a journey to, to, to kind of figure it out. And it's not like I was like, you know, 13, 14 going, I'm going on a quest. It's really that I just started. The outside world was so unpredictable and people, I was suspicious of other people. I didn't feel like I could trust other people so much in my life felt um, it just changed too quickly, too often. Nothing was stable. I didn't feel safe. Nothing felt secure. And I said, but the one thing is, is that God, 
call it God, source, the divine love, universe, consciousness, higher power. I never give a shit what anybody calls it. But to me, God had never let me down. I was really clear that it wasn't, you know, sometimes awful things happen and people will say, why did God let this happen? And for me, I was never confused. I was like, God didn't do any of this. This was a guy, this was a human being in his flawed humanity who made this decision, right? So I never did this, uh, did this whole raging thing against, you know, the divine or a higher power. And so um, for me, I was like, I felt like I could always rely on something greater than me. And mm -hmm. I could go within and trust something that was in me. And that was a long process, learning to trust myself, my inner teacher, my Ooh. inner voice, my intuition, all of that. So long story short, in a desire to end my own suffering, I gathered a lot of tools. I met a lot of spiritual teachers. I traveled and did spiritual pilgrimages, like at a young age. And so I've been on this journey for, you know, I'm 54, so 40, 40 some odd years gathering mm -hmm. tools and practices and spiritual uh, resources and whatever, so that now I can in turn, you know, go back and um, help others. And there's a great quote that I got in a fortune cookie once that said, you know, a mentor's hindsight becomes your foresight. And so mm -hmm. that's now what um, I like to do is to help other people who are trying to, um, you know, move through their own grief or suffering or habits they don't want or stories they need to change, et cetera. Yes. And, you know, that's a, like for, for someone who left home at 17 as well, I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember like, just like the night my dad dropped me off, it was like, it was pouring rain and he had just, it was like, he insisted we're going this night. And like what my little mattress, I just had a twin mattress and a little bit of belongings and it was in the back and it was soaking wet. And I remember going into this apartment that I was going to share with my half sister, which I'd only met once, mm -hmm. um, going in there and just like that night, just like, okay, trying to set something up. The power wasn't on yet going in the dark, trying to, okay, well, I'm gonna take this bedroom, I guess. And trying to set things up and having a wet mattress. And it's just like going to bed and just cry myself to sleep. And I did for often for a while thinking, what, what am I doing? But I know I can't be there. Right. And, uh, but there, there's like, like something that it's the same as when I was diagnosed with cancer. It's like, I kind of tuned out, like what the heck is going on? But then the same, same kind of power at diagnosed with cancer at what was I, um, oh, 40 something. And then, um, same with at 17, just like this inner warrior coming like, okay, I got to rely on me and I got to do something. And that mm -hmm. seems to be like the same with you. It's like you had to turn to something and books was something for you. It was the exact same for me. Metaphysical mm -hmm. bookstores were my passion. I would, mm -hmm. I'd spend hours in there. Yeah, me too. For sure. All kinds mm -hmm. of bookstores. Like just put me around the books and my nervous system would just kind of like down regulate yep. in, a really, in a really good way. Yes, yes, yes. So you started with books. We're going to take a break in a moment. You started with books. Was there an, a, like a for me, it was like, I remember, and, and I can't remember what age I was. This book's been out a long time, but I'm seeing it resurface now. Women Who Run With The Wolves was one of my favorites. Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Mm -hmm. It was a book, yes. one of my life-changing books as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Incredible. But I'll yeah. tell you, when we come back from break, I'll tell you, uh, how, <laughs> yes, the book, the book story that led me to my, one of my main mentors and spiritual godmothers. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. And uh, Karen and I will be right back. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone, to Transformation with Martine, where we conquer everything and compromise nothing. My guest today is Karen Kenny, and we are talking all types of transport transformation. <laughs> and we are going to get into owning your magic very soon here. But we left off talking about books that um, that really kind of led us on a journey, um, both of us leaving home at 17 and um, just being on a quest to find a better way to live, to take care of the pain inside. Mm -hmm. So Karen, what were some of the books that really touched your heart and then led you to one of your main mentors? Yeah. So interestingly enough, people always laugh when I say this. So I talk about having a, a spiritual team and I always say, oh, spiritual team on the job, right? 
And so growing up for sure, um, right after my mother was killed, like I was 12 years old, I was a reader and I first discovered Stephen King. And people often laugh at that because I say Stephen King was, um, is on my spiritual team. And I ended up meeting him uh, when I was like 18 years old, which is a story for another day. Um, But uh, his books literally like saved me at that age. And I have such a warm spot in my heart for him. And people always think of him as like the king of horror. But mm-hmm. there's actually a lot of humanity in his books and it really helped me. So that was like, I just have to do that little plug for that. But it's probably one of the greatest books. Like also in college, I read a book called uh, Women Who Love Too Much. And I'll never forget being horrified and identifying myself on those pages. But that one threw me for a loop. So that was a really big one at that age when I was like probably 19, 18, 19 years old. But mm-hmm. what really, what really kind of turned turned the ship for me is when I was living in Los Angeles, I was there at the height of like, we're talking like 91 to like 98 uh, 99 that time. And that was like the, the boom. And it was like Oprah and Marianne Williamson and Tony Robbins and Ayanla Van Zandt and Wayne Dyer and Deepak Chopra, like everybody, Louise Hay, like everybody was like in that area. Right. Yeah. And so um, one day I was at the bookstore because that's where I often spent time. Even if I had no money, I would just go to the bookstore yeah. and hang out. Yeah. Um, and I was walking, I was over at the time I was like into personal fitness. I was a personal trainer, uh, and lift. I used to love to, I've always been a gym rat, love to lift weights yeah. and stuff. And I was in one section of the bookstore where it was like the fitness mags and the muscle mags. And all of a sudden I literally hear a voice in my head say, and it was not my voice say, you should go to the self help section because you mm-hmm. could use some help. Wow. And I was like. I was like, whatever. So I just started over to the back then the self-help section. I was the only one in the aisle. And as I was walking down the aisle, literally a book just fell off the shelf and like landed at my feet Mm -hmm. and divine intervention or whatever. And so I looked down and looking up from me, you know, up at me from the floor was a picture of a woman. And she kind of like had her head, (laughs) her chin resting on her hand. And it said on the front, I returned to love. Uh-huh. reflections on the principles of you know the course in miracles and I was like who's this broad I was like who's this lady right but I pick it up and I read the cover and I say well I could use a miracle <laughs> and I was like okay and I opened it up and this was before like bookstores had chairs like borders where you could like mm-hmm. sit in the chairs and hang out yep. all day so I open up the book and I start to read and I say two things happen I simultaneously become amazed because I had never heard anybody as a kid who, who was raised Catholic or whatever, I'd never heard anybody talk about God and forgiveness and stuff like that in that way. So I was immediately yeah. intrigued and fascinated. And then I was also immediately pissed off because it was the first time somebody had ever said, well, you have a choice and you get to be responsible for your own happiness and your own suffering. And so I had these two like push pull things, but I was so fascinated and curious and uh, pulled in that I literally, I'll just never forget. I crossed my legs and I just sat on the floor and I just poured through that book. And I always say a return to love is the gateway drug to A Course in Miracles. And that's when I got introduced to A Course in Miracles, which is a huge, you know, 1200 page book. Um, And so those two books absolutely changed my life. And it was from there, like I said, at, at that bookstore in Burbank, California, where I also picked up Women Who Run With the Wolves, with Dr. Yeah. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, Motherless yeah. Daughters from Hope Edelman. That changed my life. But so, I mean, look, we don't have enough time to list all the books, but right. I will say that um, A Return to Love was a game changer. And, you know, I was broke at the time, so I didn't have a car. I was taking public transportation and the bus everywhere. But one of the first things I did when I got a vehicle is that Marianne, Marianne Williamson, used to do weekly lectures on A Course in Miracles at the Wilbur mm-hmm. Theater in, in LA. So mm-hmm. I started going to those lectures and then she had um, a workshop, uh, like a day long thing workshop at the Agape Church. Well, Dr. Reverend Michael Michael Beckwith, that's yep. his chirp, Agape. And so I went there and I got to meet him and do all that. And then I, I, um, I asked a question. I stood up and asked a question at one of, uh, at that event. And she was doing a whole thing on relationships. And I got up to the mic. I thought I had my question. And, but when I opened my mouth, something else came out and I was asking her, I said, I don't understand this whole forgiveness thing. 
-hmm. And then she asked me, do you have something to forgive? And I said, yeah, you know, my mother was murdered and she started coming to me in my dreams and saying, I've forgiven him. Now it's your turn. And I don't know how to fucking do that. And so she brought me up on stage. We had this unbelievable experience that was life-changing and everybody in the audience was like bawling. And then afterwards, one of her assistants came up to me and said, you know, Marianne wants to talk to you. And so pulled me aside, whatever. And she took my number and whatever. The long story short is she ended up calling me. I ended up meeting with her at David Kessler's house. And David Kessler is one of the leading uh, experts on grief. And he's done a lot of work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and he's incredible. So through that, I ended up, you know, doing all these things, going on spiritual pilgrimages to like Egypt and England and Ireland to Merlin's cave and Glastonbury tour and the great pyramids of Giza. And so again, so I'm in my twenties traveling around the world, doing this work to heal myself. And again, mm -hmm. gathering resources and tools and all this stuff um, that went on to become, which led me to becoming a yoga teacher, which led me to becoming a spiritual mentor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So my, I was just following my own curiosity and my own path again, in a desire to end my own suffering. But along the way, I put a lot of stuff in what I call the spiritual toolkit. And now I share those tools, whether it's integrative hypnosis, spiritual mentoring, coaching the conscious and unconscious mind, uh, mm -hmm. hypnosis, whatever the thing is to help others to now get out of their own way, to tell better stories in their own favor and to you know reprogram their subconscious mind and to tell better stories about themselves. So it has mm -hmm. been my, you know, and this is the whole point of the own your magic. Mm -hmm. people are like what do you mean by that I said well in owning what I mean by own your magic first of all it's a, the name of a retreat that I'm doing in April but it's also a way of looking at ourselves I say you have to be willing to own both your brilliance and your bullshit you have to be willing to both own both your brilliance and your bullshit and so many of us think that we are flawed that we're fucked up that we need to be fixed that we're broken and I don't believe that to be true. I know that we often have things that happen in our life that are incredibly difficult, that knock us on us at our ass, take us out at the knees. Like we just feel like, I, I don't know if I can bear the weight of this thing because some horrible and wicked hard things, right? Wicked hard shit happens yeah. to people all the time here in the human experience. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's this idea that we think like all these awful things that are happened to us, like we, we, we're we just like, these are bad or whatever. And I said, no, a lot of those things, when we know how to use the alchemy, when we know how to alchemize them, those things like like Joseph Campbell says, you know, the, 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 the dark cave, I'm paraphrasing, the dark cave that you fear to enter holds your, holds your treasure. So for me, it's about being able to take these things that we think of as shit that needs to be fixed and I say within them is your strength and your resiliency and your gifts as well. But we got to be willing to own how we've created survival mechanisms because of those traumas that are now no longer serving us as adults. The things we often went through as children, you know, people always say to me, do you work with kids? And I said, technically, no, I work with adults, but I'm really working with little kids and adult bodies. Right. All oh, right. Gosh. Mm -hmm. I love everything you're saying and just the whole thing and the, the brilliance and your bullshit. It's true. It's like, we got to take ownership for these things. Yeah. There's so many things that have happened to you and me and so many people. To everybody who's listening, like, to everybody huh? who's listening, to everybody who's listening, something has happened, right. That has, has, has made them to look at themselves through a less than yes. loving lens. And yes. I would say that part of though, our strength, our wisdom, our, our genius lies within the brilliance and the bullshit. And when we, when we ex willing to understand, and we can talk more about this after the break, but when we can alchemize those things, and I have a little example so people can understand a little bit better what I'm talking about. When we alchemize those things, we understand that it is both our flawed humanity, right? Our clumsiness, the things that we've done, the things we wish we didn't do, things we wish we didn't say, those experiences that were that were heavy and our lightness, our divinity, our brilliance, that is, that combination is your magic. Yes, I agree. I agree hundred percent. It really wasn't until I um, decided to 
um, accept my bullshit and story and start changing my story here. Like, Hey, this is actually for me. It's been for me all along. Yes, it was hard, but it's been for me all along. I couldn't be where I am at all. Sure. Today you wouldn't be who you are. You wouldn't right. be who you are without those things. And that's the path of, you know, the process I use it. I call your story to your glory. Yes. It's being able to look at those things and saying, what in this, what in this is actually useful and valuable? What have I learned from this mm -hmm. that I can then use for myself or to possibly, depending on the line of work that you're in, help others? Absolutely. hundred percent. So before we take a break, where can people find you, Karen? Uh, KarenKenny.com. K-E-N-N-E-Y.com. Yeah, and isn't it Instagram? You have live next to it or something too, right? Yeah, on like, yeah, I didn't know how much time we had. Yeah, on Instagram, it's at Karen. You know, it's Karen Kenny Live L I V E. Mm -hmm. Same thing on Facebook and the other places. And my podcast is the Karen Kenny Show. Awesome. We'll be right back, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is a great show. Be back in a few. My guest today is Karen Kenny. We've been talking about transformation and owning our brilliance and our bullshit and <laughs> how your story leads to your glory and all these wonderful phrases that Karen has. Um, and I just, I just resonate with them so well because it's like after you reach a certain point in your journey, you, you realize how life is for you. It's not against you, that all the things that happen to you, it's hard. Gosh, it can be so hard. And at the same time, if you, if you take that time, to break down the lessons and realize, geez, I, I learned so much and other things will happen in your life. And you, and you go back like, Oh, I can go, I, I can handle this because of what I went through here and all the evidence I have that I can get through this because I went, what I went through here. It, it's amazing. I, I think to um, just go back over and, and just realize how courageous and brave and resilient we as humans are. I mean, we really are. I 100% agree. And but we lose sight of that a lot of times, you know, because when you're yes. in it, you're in it and you're not no. recognizing, oh, at some point, I'll be on the other side of it, you know, mm -hmm. and that's why like, we can't rush that process. We can't rush forgiveness, we can't, if, you know, and right. we can't rush right. the, the whole thing. And so it can be hard to kind of see on the other side and look back and think, well, at some point I'm going to be grateful for this, you know, and mm -hmm. the great poet, Mary Oliver has, uh, has a beautiful line in, in a poem that says, someone once gave me a box of darkness. And um, mm -hmm. she says it, I, I think the next line is something like, it took me time to realize that this too was a gift. Yeah. And that's kind of how I look at things. And, you know, when I was talking about like the whole <clears throat> own your magic thing, and the humanity and the divinity. I, I say, try to try to imagine that like Merlin the wizard was making <clears throat> a magic potion or that if that doesn't resonate, I, I mean, I love Merlin. I've been to Merlin's cave in Tintagel um, in Cornwall, England. It was a game changer for me. I'm a little yeah. obsessed with, with all that stuff. But um, imagine if you would like three witches standing around, like as we grew up, you know, and the witches are saying, you know, um, <laughs> which is a vegan. I hate these examples. They'll be like, you know, I am newt in sprig of whatever. So I would yeah. say like, if there are witches around a cauldron and they were making a magic potion of me, right, Karen, KK, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what would be in there? And I'd be like, okay, Boston accent, grew up in Lawrence, went yeah. to be you, dead murdered mother, was inappropriately touched as a child. Like all the things, right? The pain, the suffering, everything would go into the yep. pot to make the magic of me. So we don't want to cast out, you know, I know we might not want to revisit awful things. I'm not saying they feel good. And I'm not saying that you need to try and find something, um, you know, glorious in something awful like a rape or, a, you know, somebody you love dying. But I will say that the results of those things sometimes can really give us gifts and insights and like, as you were talking about resiliency yep. and, you know, it's interesting that you use the word evidence because that's actually um, the working title of my memoir is oh. that we do gather evidence for mm -hmm. um, just exactly who we are, who we really are, which I would say is either one of God's kids or a simpler way to say it. What we really are is love. Mm -hmm. And if what we really are simply is love, 
then our only, and that's our identity, then our only purpose is to extend that love. And I don't want to use circumstances and shit that awful things that have happened to me throughout my life as an excuse as to why I cannot then be loving. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you know what I mean? And so oh, a lot of times we can use these things that have happened to us um, as excuses and reasons as to why we can't fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And this is why having a really great mentor or a really great coach or whatever, because there are times when we feel stuck. There are times when we can't yep. see a different perspective, when we can't shift our mind from fear to love and we need help from somebody. Again, a mentor's hindsight is can be your foresight. And so that's what a good mentor does is not only do they provide you with spiritual tools, if you're like in my case, a spiritual mentor, but they provide you with tools and resources, but they're also giving you their experience, their education. They're also mm -hmm. giving you the ability to uh, save you time and save you suffering. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you don't have to suffer as long or as deeply. You know what I mean? Right. You don't. You don't. And, um, and you know, it, it's like sometimes we just need, we need somebody by our side. We need somebody to see things that we don't see. We, we need somebody to see the goodness in us and the, you know, um, that's, I, I did, I did, especially in the beginning, need somebody to believe in me because I really didn't believe in me. Well, a hundred percent. And that's one of the things that I'll often say to my clients is says, I hold the vision and the strength of you, the wholeness, the happy, like who you really are is, you know, you, underneath it all right beyond this illusion, the body, the separation, who you really are uh, in your original form is happy, healthy, healed, whole, and holy. And it's the things of this world that make us feel separate and stuck and scared yeah. and sick and in scarcity and like all this shit, right? So we need somebody to remember our wholeness and our holiness. I don't mean holiness, like piousness, the right. fact that we are an extension of love itself. Mm -hmm. We need somebody to remind us of that in two things. And that, that I think are really important. There's two different ways of saying it. You know, in A Course in Miracles, there's this, there's this line that basically says um, how you see another person. Every time you meet another person, remember, it is an holy en a holy encounter. And yeah. how you see them is how you will see yourself. How you treat them is how you treat yourself. Right. So it's really important that just even for quote unquote selfish reasons that we hold the highest vision of our brothers and sisters and people and friends and family mm -hmm. around us. And there's another teacher, he's more like a neuroscience and a hypnotist teacher, uh, John Overdurf. And the way that he kind of takes that and says it in his own way, and he's not related to A Course in Miracles, but so often because I've been a student of A Course in Miracles for like 30, 40, I don't know, wicked long time, <laughs> over 30 yeah. years, is that everything kind of goes through that lens sometimes where I'm like, ooh, that sounds just like this. But John Overdurf says basically, a person, I'm paraphrasing, a person can only be as as um, as good, right? And that could mean as well as healed or whatever in your presence mm -hmm. as they are in your mind. So when we have a loved one who is sick, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, whatever, the greatest thing that we can give them besides our compassion and care, if we can help them, is to hold a vision of them as they really are. If we meet them at the same level of them seeing themselves as flawed or broken or fucked up, or they need to be fixed and they can't, they're yeah. a mess, right? I'm a mess. Well, I'm not going to meet you at that level. That's not helpful if we're both down there holding that viewpoint. So you know, I've got to rise above and I have to go above the battleground, as we would say in The Course in Miracles, have a yeah. higher perspective. So because so, whoever is saner at the time has to hold the vision. Yes. And when people are oh, down yeah. in it, you don't go down there with them and stay there. You can meet them there compassionately and mm -hmm. hold their hand and feed them soup and, you know, give them hugs and love them. Yes. But I'm not going to meet you down there and agree with you in the fact that you think you're so fucked up and you're broken. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. I mm -hmm. will listen. I will unshamingly bear witness to what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I don't have to say it with my mouth. But in my mind, I'm going to continue to hold a vision of them as how they I perceive they really are, right. which is they are whole and holy and healthy and healed and happy. And that, um, you know, they have their own brilliance that is uh, call it God given, 
universal divine. I don't care what, again, what people call it, but um, mm -hmm. one of the greatest gifts we can give people. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's really interesting how, you know, you talk about people and just, just seeing them in their light. It's like, I've, I've had a really interesting experience with a couple people just at this hotel staff mm -hmm. and just like, I am, I mean, just, I mean, honestly, I'm a very nice, loving person. It is who I am. So I do treat people very nice. And, and I've just been, I don't know, drawn to a couple of people and we've had these conversations and it's like, they are, <laughs> I, one, one of the staff members, like he, he went and got a few things for me and he came back with this brownie and he's like, I just want you to have this. There's like this sweet, like, like he just wants to be nice to me because of how I've been for him. And it's just, it's like when you, when you, when you are in love, more love just, just comes. Well, people can feel whether you say it or not, you don't need, it, you could be put being fucking quote unquote, nice to people. I'm not talking about you. I'm trying to make a yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. You I know quote unquote, nice to people, but I often say, you know, oh, she's a person who smiles with her mouth, but not her eyes. Yeah. Right. right? So people can feel your compassion, mm -hmm. your curiosity, you're leaning in towards them yeah. and they can feel your contempt. And they can oh. feel your judgment, even if you never say it, because it's energetics. It's yeah. energetics. So I can tell when I walk into a room and I do not feel welcome. I right. can tell when I go to a place. And as my one of my trauma teachers, Linda Tai, says, people delight in you. People mm -hmm. delight in you. And that's what you I want. That. So I can tell when somebody is... Um, doing one thing with their mouth or saying one thing with their mouth, but they're out of alignment or they're incongruent. There's no congruency there. And that's why a lot of times people's businesses don't do that well. They're saying one thing, but everything else is actually projecting that energetics. And that's why I always say to my clients, hey, look, the assignment is alignment. The assignment is alignment. And if you're out of alignment and your mouth is saying, like, I mean, if your mouth is saying shit that you actually can't, like, you know, writing checks that you can't cash because you're not actually doing that inner work and you're saying one thing, but vibing in another way, it's a recipe for <laughs> things not being so soothing. <laughs> no doubt. I'm not going to get anywhere. And that, that is something that it, it took me a while really to realize, you know, that, even, you know, as a coach and marketing and, and all that, it's like, if I'm not even like putting a post out there or, or putting a, a call to action or whatever, if, if, if it doesn't even go out in the right energy, nobody's going to receive it. Nobody. So it starts with you, which takes us all the way back full circle. I mean, people got to get right with themselves first, yeah. right? That's the whole thing. You got to do your own work first. Yeah. Because anything that you're putting out there is just an extension. It's like an imprint. It's like A Course in Miracles, we'd say, it is an outward picture, an outward reflection of an inward condition. For sure. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So we're constantly broadcasting who we are, what we think, what we feel. So we have to get aligned and congruent within ourselves first before we start to try and lead anybody else, coach anybody else, do anything else. And it's an ongoing thing because this yeah. being human is an ongoing problem. We're constantly in an evolution and we're constantly on a quest. There's no like, oh, I'm spiritual now, I've arrived. That's not how this works. No, no. And it says, I, I don't, I was talking to another, you know, colleague the other day, just like, we can't be trying to take someone somewhere we haven't gone. This doesn't even work can't do that. that and that's well, you can, fraud, you can really. point, yeah you can point directions but you can't actually offer them anything valuable or helpful if you no. haven't experienced it and yeah. embodied it and spent some yep. time with it exactly exactly yeah. so we are going to take a break again and then karen i would love it if you just shared some of your um tools in your little toolbox there when we come back yeah yeah sure okay we'll be right back everyone Thank you so much for tuning in. Welcome back everyone to Transformation with Martine, where we conquer everything and compromise nothing. My guest today is Karen Kenny, and we've been talking about all things transformation. A lot of uh, good um, book recommendations. Make sure you go back um, and listen if, if you're just, you know, you're catching the end or go back and listen to the whole show. There's all kinds of good tips, not just on books, but just, just so many different things. This is a great show. So Karen, um, we talked a little bit on break and I know 
this all depends on the person, the circumstance, where you are, where they are in life. Mm -hmm. um, how would you approach, how would you handle someone who just perhaps you could be anywhere, could be at one of your events, it could be at a Starbucks, it could be anywhere that just happened to ask you about forgiveness, perhaps, like, how mm -hmm. would you forgive your mother, your father? Yeah. yeah. Well, so as I was saying on the break, it would really depend on what they were talking about. There's so many layers to it, right? And I think that we have a lot of, the, one of the cool things about it, having a lot of different tools mm -hmm. is that I can kind of trust my intuition, my inner teacher to guide me as to maybe what to say and what to share. Mm -hmm. You know, and it depends on what the thing is. You know, here the, here's the thing in the spiritual community. Spiritual people love to tell you, and even in A Course in Miracles, A Course in Miracles would tell you that the that forgiveness is the key to happiness. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. And I do know through my own journey of trying, you know, trying and succeeding and forgiving the guy that murdered my mother, um, that that was a tall ask, but I didn't do it for him. <laughs> I didn't do it for his soul. Mm -hmm. I did it for me. I did it for me because I was creating a prison of yeah. my own making. And if I was going to put him in prison, right, for being a, a coward and a, a, a violent, you know, bastard or whatever I wanted to call him at the time, um, mm -hmm. I am like the thing about putting somebody in a prison in your mind is that you then have to be the jailer, you have to be the god, and you have to be the warden. And at the end of the day, the prisoners don't go home. You stay in there with them because you're holding the key. So for me, and again, I'm not going to tell anybody who, when, and why they should forgive. I will, I do have some caveats, but I will say this. Um, I didn't want to be in prison with that murderer anymore. I wanted to let mm -hmm. myself out. So I had to take my own steps to do it. But I will say this, there was no getting to forgiveness without me first going through the pain and the terror and the rage and the anger. I was mm -hmm. only really able to forgive that person because I let myself feel and think and say all the awful things that I wanted to feel, think, think and say to him. Yeah. And it was a complicated journey. And I would say, read the memoir when it comes out. <laughs> you'll When that mm -hmm. time comes, you'll get the longest story to that. But if somebody mm -hmm. just came up to me and was like, I really need to forgive my mother or my father, I would probably then ask uh, some specific questions which was like, like what happened? Because sometimes people need an unshaming witness to hear the story first. And then I would ask them, why do you want to forgive them? Perhaps because sometimes people think they just should. Right. And I'm like, you can't rush this process. You get to forgive people in your own time and in your own way. And when you feel ready, because you want to knock a some book, or some religion, or somebody else said, you have to do this. When you start to get a sneaking, like I'm touching my nose right now, like if you start to get a sneaking suspicion that something is starting to smell funny, like you're yeah. starting to sit in, I call it sitting in the shitty diaper, right? When uh -huh. you're sitting in the wound too long and it starts to fester, when you start to self-realize that I need to do something because now this is stopping me, this is keeping right. me stuck, this is making me suffer, now it's no longer what that person did 10 years ago, five years ago, 20 days ago. It's what I'm continuing to drag forward from what happened. What is the meaning I've assigned to this thing and all that stuff. So there are, there are lots of different tools. Some that are very more spiritual leaning that are more like pray for that person for 30 days, as much as you're like, don't fucking want to, like you can pray for their yeah. happiness and well being for 30 days and either your mind will change or they'll change or you won't care anymore. Right. I right. mean, there's a thousand different ways. And again, it depends on who I'm talking to, what tools, what like subconscious programming tools, maybe we'll do some tapping. Maybe we'll do some bilateral stimulation. Maybe we'll do some things to literally shift your mind out of that place to stop the anxiety of that memory or whatever. So there's no one prescription. I think the first step is getting clear on, I'm starting to feel like I need to do this and I want to do this. And I, 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 I might, I, I don't know if I'm ready to do it, but I want to be ready. I'm willing to be ready. Right for your own peace of mind. You know what I'm saying? I do. It's not about the other person. 
you know, mm -hmm. but when you forgive somebody else, you're also forgiving yourself. We're all minds are joined. We're all connected. Just like we were talking about, somebody can feel your contempt, whether you say it or not. They can feel your judgment, whether your big mouth says it out loud or not. So yep. we can feel that linkage. And when we're ready to say, like, you know, it's not about setting them free. It's about setting you free. But when you set yourself free, it's like everybody benefits. Yeah. And I don't want to be weighed down. I remember one time I was doing this thing in California. Uh, this, I did a couple of them, these weekend things where it was all about personal development and leadership or whatever. And they had us doing crazy shit. But one of the things I'll never forget, one of them just came right up to me and said, aren't you exhausted? And I was like, what do you mean? Aren't you so tired of dragging your dead mother's bloody body around behind you everywhere you go? And whoa. I was like, whoa. And they're like, can you please let the woman rest? Set her down already. And I was like, what the fuck? But it like all of a sudden I realized like I'm over here dragging this thing around and I'm leaving. Now I'm the one. I'm the one leaving the bloody mess. So I had to get out of that victimization. I had to change my story because it was no longer serving me anymore either. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent it does. Oh, yeah. and that's the way to I've never heard it like that before. You and know, that's what I, I say to people. Like, yeah, oh. I'm sorry, God. Yeah, carrying the weight of trauma, carrying the weight of these, like I think a lot of what that pops in my mind first off is the first man that molested me. He was this big guy with this big belly and these overalls. I hate overalls. I still hate overalls, which I guess I'm carrying them still a little bit. If I still hate overalls, I don't well, know. And, there, and if you want it, but here's the thing. If you, I'm not going to say to you, you should get over overalls. Yeah, but if you like, said to me, I saw these really cute overalls and I want to be able to wear them. I would say yeah. there's tools to help you shift right. your mind over that reaction to the overalls. Yeah. But I'm not going to yeah. say to you, you should get forgive that guy and get over the overalls. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it has yeah. to be self-directed mm -hmm. that people want to learn tools and skill sets and practices to be able to self-resource. Mm -hmm. So we're yeah. not waiting for the world to show up the way that we need to, to feel safe, that mm -hmm. we can try to learn how to move through the world with more fun, flow, and freedom because we've learned self-resourcing skills. Mm -hmm. that's the that's the work I love to do is to help people learn how to help themselves for sure absolutely 100 percent. yeah so um we just have just a minute or so left mm -hmm. um where can people find you and also like just I don't know like you, you've got these good phrases already own your brilliance and your bullshit like what what do you want to like just I guess in a nutshell just what do you want to leave somebody with one minute left and just oh, no pressure no pressure and no pressure at all just I fit mean, it all just, in that little minute i think the, the the thing is is that that we feel like we feel like we're stuck and we feel like we have to do it all on our own and we feel like we have to figure it all out and i always say to people your best thinking is what got you here where you are right now wherever right. you're suffering so one of the greatest investments you can make and whether it's getting a library card where you can get something for free or listening to a podcast or finding a coach or a mentor. It's like, try to find ways. And I understand about economic disparity and different things, but there are free resources and free tools. So I just wanna encourage people to follow their curiosity, empower themselves, ask for help, try to find ways so that you can return to love, so yeah. that you can own your magic, so you can transform your story to your glory because you deserve it. It is your natural birthright, happiness, and peace. Mm, I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and your wisdom and on all that you do for this world. Um, yeah, this has been a really good show. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And um, please join us next week at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, every Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it so much. And thank you for listening if you're listening. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Reach out to me if you have an awesome story you want to share as well. Okay. <laughs> See you next Friday. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 
Thank you for tuning in to Transformation with Martinet. Real, raw, and vulnerable conversations. Listen or watch live every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. As Martinet and her guests have deep, meaningful conversations, sharing empowering stories. Step into your passions and lead with your heart. If you are ready to accept and love you for you, visit martineemmons.com and start allowing transformation to happen today.